Hello, bros, I'm Uncle Tess Effect Zero, bro, Fire Production, and a Five, Minecraft, Lord of the Rings, Mom. So, let's just start up the audiobook. Open, and done a good deal of planning on our own account. You're not going to escape so easily, but I must go, said Frodo. It cannot be helped, dear friends. It is wretched for us all. But okay. it is no use your trying spawn. to keep me. Yeah. Since you've guessed so much, no. please help me and do not hinder me. You do not understand, said Pippin. You must go, and therefore we must too. Mary and I are going with you. Sam is an excellent fellow and would jump down a dragon's throat to save you, if he did not trip over his own feet. But you will need more than one companion on your dangerous adventure. My dear and most beloved hobbits, said Frodo, deeply moved. But I, I could not allow it. I decided that long ago, too. You speak of danger, but you do not understand. This is not treasure hunt. No there and back journey. I'm flying from deadly peril into deadly peril. Of course we understand, said Mary firmly. That is why we have decided to come. We know the ring is no laughing matter, but we are going to do our best to help you against the enemy. The ring! said Frodo, now completely amazed. Yes, the ring. My dear old hobbit, don't you allow for an inquisitiveness of friend? I've known about the existence of the ring for years, before Bilbo went away, in fact. But since he obviously regarded it as secret, I kept the knowledge in my head until we formed our conspiracy. I did not know Bilbo, of course, as well as I know you. I was too young. If you want to know how I first found out, I'll tell you. Go on, said Frodo faintly. It was the Sackville Bagginses that were his downfall, as you might expect. One day, a year before the party, I happened to be walking along the road when I saw Bilbo ahead. Suddenly, in the distance, the SBs appeared, coming towards us. Bilbo slowed down, and hey, presto, he vanished. I was so startled, I hardly had the wits to hide myself in a more ordinary fashion, but I got through the edge and walked along the field inside. I was peeping through the road after the SBs had passed, and was looking straight at Bilbo when he suddenly reappeared. I caught a glint of gold as he put something back into his trouser pocket. After that, I kept my eyes open. In fact, I confess that I spied. You must admit that it was very intriguing. And I was only my teens. I must be the only one in the Shire besides you, Frodo, that has ever seen the old fellow's secret book. You read his book? cried Frodo. Good heavens above, is nothing safe? Mm, not too safe, I should say, said Mary. But I, I have only had one rapid glance. And that was difficult Why to get. Jump them there? He never left the book about. I wonder what became of it. I should like another look. Have you got it, Frodo? No. It was not a bag end. He must have taken it away. Hmm. Well, as I was saying, Mary proceeded, I kept my knowledge to myself till the spring when things got serious. Then we formed our conspiracy. And as we were serious too, and meant business, we have not been too scrupulous. You're not a very easy nut to crack, and... Gandalf is worse, but if you want to be introduced to our chief investigator, I can introduce him. W where is he? said Frodo, looking around as if he expected a masked and sinister figure to come out of a cupboard. Step forward, Sam, said Mary. And Sam stood up with the face scarlet up to the ears. Here's our collector of information, and he collected a lot, I can tell you, before he was finally caught, after which I may say... He seemed to regard himself as on parole, and dried up. <laughs> Sam! cried Frodo, feeling that amazement could go no further, and quite unable to decide whether he felt angry, amused, relieved, or merely foolish. Yes, sir, said Sam. I give you a pardon, sir, but I, I meant no wrong to you. Mr. Frodo, nor, nor, nor Mr. Gandalf, for that matter. He has some sense, mind you, and when you, when you said go alone, he said no! Take someone you can trust. But it does not seem that I can trust anyone, said Frodo. Sam looked at him unhappily. It all depends on what you want, put in Mary. You can trust us to stick to you through thick and thin. I don't want to, the to start fighting the war to us yet. I want to have any some secret kind of security you you yourself. for that. But you cannot trust us and to let you face trouble alone. Also want to get go off without a word. With Are your friends, Frodo? Anyway. There it is. We know most of what Gandalf has told you. We know a good deal about the ring. We are horribly afraid. 
But we are coming with you. Or following you like hounds. And after all, sir, added Sam, you did ought to take the elves' advice. Gildor said you should keep them as willing, and you can't deny it. I don't deny it, said Frodo, looking at Sam, who is now grinning. All right, uh, I don't deny it, but I'll never believe you are sleeping get, again, whether you snore or not. There. I shall kick you hard to make sure. You are a set of deceitful scoundrels, he said, turning to the others. But bless you, he laughed, <laughs> getting up and waving his arms. I give in. I will take Gildor's advice. If the danger were not so dark, I should dance for joy. Even so, I cannot help feeling happy, happier than I have felt for a long time. I had dreaded this evening. Good. That's settled. Three cheers for Captain Frodo and company. company! They shouted, and they danced around him. Hey. Merry and Pippin began a song which they had apparently got ready for the occasion. It was made on the model of the dwarf song that started Bilbo on his adventure long ago, and went to the same tune. Farewell we call to hearth and hall, the wind may blow and rain may fall. wonder if that song actually has copyright claims on it. I don't think it actually does, but... Through moor and waste we ride in haste, and whither then we cannot tell. With foes ahead behind us tread, beneath the sky shall be our bed. Think this, uh... Until at last our toy be past, our journey done, our errands I think the West Gate is actually where you're at the Moria, kind of? We must away, we must away, we ride before the break of day. Very good, said Frodo, but in that case there are a lot of things to do before we go to bed, under a roof or tonight or at any rate. Oh, that was poetry, said Pippin. Do you really mean to start before the break of day? I don't know. I fear those black riders, and I'm sure it is unsafe to stay in one place long, especially in a place which it is Digging known as going. Uh, it's also, Gildor advised me not to time. wait, but I should very much like to see Gandalf. Probably be I could see that even Gildor was disturbed when he heard that Gandalf had never appeared. Uh, it really depends on two things. When I do how soon could the riders get to Buckleberry? I mean, I... And how soon should we get off? I mean, it my take a good deal of is uh, just about as big the answer to your as the, question, <laughs> said Mary, the is that we could get off in an hour. I've prepared practically everything. There are six ponies in the stable across the fields. Doors and tackle are all packed. Except for a few extra clothes and the perishable food. It seems to have been a very efficient conspiracy, said Frodo. But what about the Black Riders? Would it be safe to wait one day for Gandalf? Oh, that all depends on what you think the Riders would do. They found you here, answered Murray. They could have reached here by now, of course, if they were not stopped at the north gate, where the hedge runs out to the river bank, just this side of the bridge. The gate guards would not let them through by night. Though they might break through, even in the daylight they would try to keep them out, I think. At any rate, until they got the message through to the master of the hole, for they would not like the look of the riders, and would certainly be frightened of them. But of course, Buckland cannot resist a determined attack for long. And it is possible that in the morning even a black rider that rode up and asked for Mr. Baggins would be let through. It is pretty generally known that you are coming back to live at Crick Hollow. Frodo sat for a while in thought. I have made up my mind, he said finally. I am starting tomorrow, as soon as it is light. But I am not going by road. It would be safer to wait here than that. If I go through the north gate, my departure from Buckland will be known at once, instead of being secret for several days at least, as it might be. And what is more, the bridge and the east road near the borders will certainly be watched, whether any rider gets into Buckland or not. We don't know how many there are, but there are at least two, and possibly more. The only thing to do is to go off in a quite unexpected direction. But, but that can be... A, but, but that can only mean going into the old forest! Said Fredegar, horrified. You can't be thinking of doing that. It is quite as dangerous as black riders. Not quite, said Mary. It sounds very desperate, but I believe Frodo is right. 
It is the only way of getting off without being allowed at once. With luck, we might get a considerable start. But, 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 but you won't have any luck in the old forest, objected Fredegar. No one ever has luck in there. You'll get lost. People don't go in there. Oh, yes, they do, said Mary. The brandy bucks go in occasionally when the fit takes them. We have a private entrance. Frodo went in once, long ago. I've been in several times, usually in daylight, of course, when the trees are sleepy and fairly quiet. <laughs> well, do as you think best, said Fredegar. I'm more afraid of the old forest than of anything I know about. The stories about it are a nightmare. My vote hardly counts as I'm not going on the journey. Still, I'm very glad someone is stopping behind to tell Gandalf what you've done when he turns up, as I am sure he will before long. Fond as he was of Frodo, Fratty Bolger had no desire of leaving the Shire, nor to see what lay outside it. His family came from East Farthing, from Budgeford and Bridgefields, in fact, but he had never been over the Brandywine Bridge. His task, according to the original plans of the conspirators, was to stay behind and deal with inquisitive folk, and to keep up as long as possible the pretense that Mr. Baggins was still living at Crick Hollow. He had even brought along some old clothes of Frodo's to help him in playing the part. They little thought how dangerous that part might prove. Excellent, said Frodo, when he understood the plan. He could not have left any message behind for Gandalf otherwise. I don't know whether these riders can read or not, of course, but I should not have dared to risk a written message in case they got in and searched the house. But if Fatty is willing to hold on the fort, and I can be sure of Gandalf knowing the way we have gone, that decides me. I'm going into the old forest, first thing tomorrow. Well, that's that, said Pippin. On the whole, I would rather have our job than Fatty's, waiting here till Black Riders come. You wait well till you are well inside the forest, said Fredegar. You'll wish you were back here with me before this time tomorrow. It's no good arguing about it anymore, said Mary. We have still got to tidy up and put the finishing touches to the packing before we get to bed. I shall call you all before the break of day. When at last he had got to bed, Frodo could not sleep for some time. His legs ached. He was glad that he was riding in the morning. Eventually, he fell into a vague dream, in which he seemed to be looking out of a high window over a dark sea of tangled trees. Down below, among the roots, there was the sound of creatures crawling and sniffing. He felt sure they would smell him out sooner or later. Then he heard a noise in the distance. At first he thought it was a great wind coming over the leaves of the forest. Then he knew that it was not leaves, but the sound of the sea, far off. A sound he had never heard in waking life, though it had often troubled his dreams. Suddenly he found he was out in the open. There were no trees after all. He was on a dark hearth, and there was a strange salt smell in the air. Looking up, he saw before him a tall white tower, standing alone on a high ridge. A great desire came over him to climb towards the tower, but suddenly a light came in the sky, and there was a noise of thunder. Frodo woke suddenly. It was still dark in the room. Mary was standing there with a the candle in one hand and banging on the door with the other. All right, what is it? Said Frodo, still shaken and bewildered. What is it? Cried Mary. It's time to get up. It's half past four and very foggy. Come on, Sammy's already getting breakfast ready. Even Pippin is up. I'm just going to saddle the ponies and fetch the one that is to be the baggage carrier. Wake that sluggard fatty. At least he must get up and see us off. Soon after six o'clock, the five hobbits were ready to start. Fatty Bolger was still yawning. They stole quietly out of the house. Mary went in front, leading a laden pony, and took his way along a path that went through a spinney behind the house and then cut across several fields. The leaves of trees were glistening, and every twig was dripping. The grass was grey with cold dew. Everything was still, and faraway noises seemed near and clear, Fowls chattering in the yard, someone closing a door of a distant house. In their shed they found the ponies, sturdy little beasts of the kind loved by hobbits, not speedy, 
but good for a long day's work. They mounted, and soon they were riding off into the mist, which seemed to open about. reluctantly before I mean, them and close forbiddingly see. behind them. Uh, After riding for about an hour, slowly and without talking, oh, they saw like the hedge looming suddenly left. ahead. It was tall and netted over with silver cobwebs. How are you uh, gonna get through this? Okay. Asked Fredegar. You know what? Follow me. Considering how more you will see. I have to go, I think I he turned to the left along the hedge, oh, and soon they came to a point where it bent inwards, running along the lip of a hollow. Oh, a cutting had been made at some distance from the hedge, and went slopingly gently down to the ground. To it had walls of bricks at the sides which rose steadily, until suddenly they arced over and formed a tunnel that dived deep under the hedge and came out in the hollow on the other side. You know, Here, I Fatty fly Bolger over the mountain and get to love going in that way. Goodbye, Frodo, he said. I wish you were not going into the forest. I only hope you will not need rescuing before the day is out. Good luck to you, today and every day. I mean, if there are no worse things time. ahead than the old forest, I shall be lucky, said Frodo. Tell Gandalf to hurry along the east road. We shall soon be back on it and going as fast as we can. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye they cried, and rode down the slope and disappeared from Fredegar's sight into the tunnel. It was dark and damp. At the far end it was closed by a gate of thick set iron bars. Is that fun the flowing around? Mary got down and unlocked the gate. In the mountains. And when they all had passed through, he pushed it to again. It shut with a clang. And the lock clicked. The sound was ominous. There, said Mary. You have left the Shire and are now outside. And on the edge of the old forest. Are the stories about it true? Asked Pippin. I don't know what stories you mean, Mary answered. If you mean the old bogey stories Fatty's nurses used to tell him, about goblins and wolves and things of that sort, I should say no. At any rate, I don't believe them. But the forest is queer. Everything in it is very much more alive and more aware of what's going on, so to speak, than things that are in the Shire. I have to go high. And the trees do not like strangers. They watch you. They are usually content merely to watch you as long as they are last. I can't see a thing. And don't do much. Occasionally oh, the shit. most unfriendly <laughs> ones may drop a branch, or stick a root out, or grasp you with a long trailer. But at night things can be most alarming, or so I'm told. I've only once or twice been here after dark, and then only near the hedge. I thought all the trees were whispering to each other, passing news and plots along the unintelligible language and the branches swayed and groped without any wind. They do say the trees do actually move, and can surround strangers and hem them in. In fact, not long ago they attacked the hedge. They came and planted themselves right by it and leaned over it. But the hobbits came and cut down hundreds of trees and made a great bonfire in the forest and burned all the ground in a long strip east of the hedge. After that, the trees gave up the attack, but they became very unfriendly. There is still a wide bare space, not far inside, where a bonfire was made. Is it only the trees that are dangerous? asked Pippin. There are various queer things living deep in the forest, and on the anything. far side, said Mary. Or at least I've heard so, but I've never seen any of them. But something makes paths. Whenever one comes inside, one finds open tracks, but they seem to shift and change from time to time in a queer fashion. Not far from this tunnel there is, or was for a long time. The beginnings of a quite broad path leading to the bonfire Damn, glade, it's even and then on a long more time or less in the east and a little north. That is the path I'm trying to find. The hobbits now left the tunnel gates and rode across the wide hollow. On the far side there was a faint path leading up to the floor of the forest, a hundred yards and more beyond the hedge, but it vanished as soon as it brought them under the trees. Looking back, they could see the dark line of hedge through the stems of trees that were already thick about them. Looking ahead, they could see only tree trunks of innumerable sizes and shapes, straight or bent, twisted, leaning squat or slender, smooth or gnarled and branched, and all the stems were green or grey with moss and slimy shaggy growths. Mary alone seemed fairly cheerful. You had better lead on and find that path, Frodo said to him. Don't let us lose one another. I forget which way the hedge lies. They picked away among the trees, and their ponies plodded along, carefully avoiding the many writhing and interlacing roots. There was no undergrowth, 
The ground was rising steadily, and as they went forward it seemed that the trees became taller, darker, and thicker. There was no sound, except an occasional drip of moisture falling through the still leaves. For the moment, there was no whispering or movement among the branches, but they all got an uncomfortable feeling that they were being watched with disapproval, deepening to dislike and even enmity. The feeling steadily grew, until they found themselves looking up quickly or glancing back over their shoulders as if they expected a sudden blow. There was not as yet any sign of a path, and the trees seemed constantly to bar their way. Pippin suddenly felt that he could not bear it any longer and without warning let out a shout. Oi! Oi! I'm not going to do anything! Just let me pass through, will you? The others halted, startled, but the cry fell as if muffled by a heavy curtain. There was no echo or answer, though the woods seemed to become more crowded and more watchful than before. I should not shout if I were you, said Mary. It does more harm than good. Frodo began to wonder if it was possible to find a way through, if he had been right to make the others come into this abominable wood. Mary was looking from side to side, and seemed already uncertain which way to go. Pippin noticed it. It has not taken you long to lose us, he said. But at that moment, Mary gave a whistle of relief and pointed ahead. Well, well, he said. These trees do shift. There is a bonfire glade in front of us, or I hope so, but the path to it seems to have moved away. The light grew clearer as they went forward. Suddenly, they came out of the trees and found themselves in a wide, circular space. There was sky above them, blue it and is. clear to their surprise. Faster. For down under the forest roof they had not been able to see the rising morning and the lifting of the mist. The sun was not, however, high enough yet to shine down into the clearing, though its light was on treetops. The leaves were all thicker and greener about the edges of the glade, enclosing it with an almost solid wall. No tree grew there, only rough grass and many tall plants. Stalky and faded hemlocks, wood parsley, fire weeds sending into fluffy ashes, and rampant nettles and thistles. A dreary place, but it seemed a charming and cheerful garden after the close forest. The hobbits felt encouraged, and looked up hopefully at the broadening daylight in the sky. At the far side of the glade there was a break in the wall of trees, and a clear path beyond it. They could see it running on into the wood, wide in places and open above, though every now and again the trees drew in and overshadowed it with their dark boughs. Up this path they rode. Up this path they rode. They were still climbing gently, but they now went much quicker and with better heart, for it seemed to them that the forest had relented and was going to let them pass unhindered after all. But after a while the air began to get hot and stuffy. The trees drew close again on either side, and they could no longer see far ahead. Now stronger than ever they felt again the ill will of the wood pressing on them. So silent was it that the fall of their ponies' hoofs rustling on dead leaves, and occasionally stumbling on hidden roots, seemed to thud in their ears. Frodo tried to sing a song to encourage them, but his voice sank to a murmur. The wanderers in the shadowed land, despair not for though dark they stand, all woods there be must end at last, and see the open sun go past. The setting sun, the rising sun, the day's end or the day begun. For at, for east or west all woods must fail. Fail. Even as he said the word, his voice faded into silence. The air seemed heavy and the making of wood wearisome. Just behind them a large branch fell from an old overhanging tree with a crash into the path. The trees seemed to close in before them. They do not like all that about yending and failing, said Mary. I should not sing any more at present. Wait till we get to the edge, and then we'll turn and give them a rousing chorus. He spoke cheerfully, and if he felt any great anxiety, he did not show it. The others did not answer. They were depressed. Okay, a heavy weight was settling a... steadily on Frodo's heart, 
Yeah. And he regretted well, now with every step forward well. that he had ever thought of challenging ah. the menace of the trees. He was indeed just about to stop and propose going back, if that was still possible, when things took a new turn. The path stopped climbing and became for a while nearly level. The dark trees drew aside and ahead they could see the path going almost straight forward. Before them, but some distance off, there stood a green hilltop, treeless, rising like a bald head out of the encircling wood. The path seemed to be making directly yeah, it for it. They now hurried forward again, uh, delighted, with the thought of climbing out for a while above the roof of the forest. I don't the like path uh, dipped, cutting down and then trees, again began to climb upwards, leading them at last to the foot of the steep hillside. Get, uh, very far. There it left the trees Melon and faded trees into I the turf. The wood okay stood all around the hill like thick down, hair that ended down. sharply in a circle around a shaven crown. Uh, natural ground, I the hobbits like led their ponies up, winding round and round until they reached the top. There they stood and gazed about them, the air was gleaming and sunny, but light, hazy, the light and they could not see to any great mellow. distance. Near at hand, the mist was now almost gone, though here and there it lay in hollows of right the wood. And to the south of them, out of a deep uh, fold Aladdin cutting right across the forest, head. the fog still well, rose like, like steam or wisps of white smoke. Yeah, said Mary, pointing with his hand. That is the line of the windy window. It comes down out of the downs and flows southwest through the midst of the forest to join the Brandywine below Hastened. We don't want to go that way. Her, so With the Withy Windle Valley, it is said to be the yeah, queerest part of the whole wood, the centre of which all the queerness head. comes, as it were. The others looked in the direction that Mary pointed out, but they could see little but mists over the damp and deep cut valley, and beyond the southern it's half of the forest tree, faded also. from view. The sun on the hilltop was now getting hot. Well, see, uh, it must have been about oh. 11 o'clock, but the autumn haze still prevented them from seeing much in other directions. In the west they could not make out either the line of the hedge or the, or the valley of the Brandywine beyond it. Northward, where they looked most hopefully, they could see nothing that might, that might be the line of the Great East Road of which they were making. They were on an island in a sea of trees, and the horizon was veiled. On the southeastern side, the ground fell very steeply, as if the slopes of the hill were continued far down under the trees, like island shores that really are the sides of a mountain rising out of deep waters. They sat on the green edge and looked out over the woods below them while they ate their midday meal. As the sun rose and passed noon, they glimpsed far off in the eastern the grey-green lines of the downs that lay beyond the old forest on that side. That cheered him greatly for it was good to see a sight of anything beyond the wood's borders, though they did not mean to go that way, if they could help it. The Barrow Downs had a sinister reputation in Hobbit legend as the forest itself. At length, they made up their minds to go on again. The path that had brought them to the hill reappeared on the northward side, but they had not followed it far before they became aware that it was bending steadily to the right. Soon it began to descend rapidly and they guessed that it must actually be heading towards the Withy Windle Valley, not at all the direction they wished to take. After some discussion they decided to leave this misleading path and strike northward. For although they had not been able to see it in front of the hilltop, the road must lie that way, and it could not be many miles off. Also northward and to the left of the path the land seemed to be drier and more open climbing up to slopes where the trees were thinner Eleanor, and pines and firs replaced the oaks and ashes and other strange and nameless trees of denser wood. At first their choice seemed to be good. They got along at a fair speed, though whenever they got a glimpse of the sun in an open glade they seemed unaccountably to have veered eastwards. But after a time the trees began to close in again, just where they had appeared from distance to be thinner and less tangled. The deep folds in the ground were discovered unexpectedly, like the ruts of great giant wheels or wide moats and sunken roads, long disused and choked with brambles. These lay unusually right across their line of march, and could not be crossed by scrambling down and out again, which was troublesome and difficult with their ponies. Each time they climbed down they found the hollow filled with thick brushes and matted undergrowth, which somehow would not yield to the left 
but only gave way when they turned to the right. And they had to go some distance along the bottom before they could find a way up the further bank. Each time they clambered out, the trees seemed deeper and darker. Around, and always to the left and upwards it was it. most difficult to find a way and they were forced to the right the and downwards. After an hour or two they had lost all clear sense of direction. I mean, though they knew well enough the that they had long ceased to go northward at all. They were being headed off and were simply following a course chosen for them. Kind of eastwards and southwards the into the heart the of the forest and not out of it. The afternoon was wearing away when they scrambled and stumbled into a fold that was wider and deeper than any they had yet met. It was so steep and overhung that it proved impossible to climb out of it again, either forwards or backwards, without leaving their ponies and their baggage behind. All they could do was to follow the fold downwards. The ground grew soft and in places boggy. Springs appeared in the banks and soon they found themselves following a brook that trickled and babbled through a weedy bed. Then the ground began to fall rapidly, and the brook, growing strong and noisy, flowed and leaped swiftly downhill. The they were in a deep, dim-lit gully overarched with trees high above them. After stumbling along for some way along the stream, they came quite suddenly out of the gloom. As if through a gate they saw the sunlight before them. Coming to the opening they found that they had made their way down through a cleft in a high yeah, speed bank, one. across a cliff. At its feet was a wide space of grass and reeds, and in the distance could be glimpsed another bank, almost as steep. A golden afternoon of late sunshine lay warm and drowsy upon the hidden land between. In the midst of it there wound lazily a dark river of brown water, bordered with ancient willows, arced over with willows, blocked with fallen willows, and flecked with thousands of faded willow leaves. The air was thick with them, fluttering yellow from the branches, for there was a warm and gentle breeze blowing softly in the valley, and the reeds were rustling and the willow bows were creaking. Well, now I have at least some notion of where we are, said Mary. We've come almost in the opposite direction which we intended. This is the river Withywindle. Now I will go on explore. He passed out into the sunshine and disappeared into the long grasses. After a while he reappeared and one. reported that there was fairly solid ground between the cliff foot and the river. That's it, it to use In some places, them. firm turf went down to the water's edge. What's more, he said, there seems to be something like a footpath winding along this side of the river. If we turn left and follow it, we shall be bound to come out on the east side of the forest eventually. I dare say, said Pippin, that this is the track goes so far and does not simply lead us into a bog and leave us there. Who made the track, do you suppose, and why? I'm sure it was not for our benefit. I'm getting very suspicious of this forest and everything in it. And I begin to believe all the stories about it. And have you any idea how far eastward we should have to go? No, said Mary. I haven't. Uh, I don't know in the least how far I down the river we here, are. Or who could possibly time, come here often enough to make a path along it. But there is no other way out that I can see or think of. There being nothing else for it, they filed out and Mary led them to the path that he had discovered. Everywhere the reeds and grasses were lush and tall, in places far above their heads. But once found, the path was easy to follow, oh, yeah, as it turned and twisted picking yet. out the sounder ground among the bogs and pools. Here and there it passed over other rills, running down gullies into the withywindle out of the higher forest lands. And at these points there were tree trunks or bundles of brushwood laid carefully across. The hobbits began to feel very uh, hot. I don't want to do this. There were armies of flies of all kinds buzzing around their ears and the afternoon sun was burning on their backs. At last they came suddenly to into a thin shade. Great grey branches reached across the path. Each step forward became more reluctant than the last. Sleepiness seemed to be creeping out of the ground and up their legs and falling softly out of the air upon their heads and eyes. Frodo felt his chin go down and his head nod. Just in front of him, Pippin fell forward onto his knees. Frodo halted. He's no good, he heard Mary saying. Can't go another step without rest. 
must have nap. It's cool under the willows. This flies. Prouder did not like the sound of this. Come on, he cried. We can't have a nap yet. We must get clear of the forest first. But the others were too far gone to care. Beside them, Sen stood yawning and blinking stupidly. Suddenly, Frodo himself felt sleep overwhelm him. His head swam. There now seemed hardly a sound in the air. The flies had stopped buzzing. Only a gentle noise on the edge of hearing, a soft fluttering as of a song half whispered, seemed to stir in the balls above. He oh lifted God. his heavy eyes and saw leaning over him a huge willow tree, old and hoary. Enormous it looked, its sprawling branches going up like reaching arms with many long fingered hands. Its knotted and twisted trunk graping in wide fissures that leaked faintly as the bows moved. The leaves fluttering against the bright sky dazzled him, and he toppled over, lying where he fell upon the grass. Merry and Pippin dragged themselves forward and lay down with their backs to the willow trunk. Behind them the great cracks gaped wide to receive them as the tree swayed and creaked. They looked up at the grey and yellow leaves, moving softly against the light and singing. They shut their eyes, and then it seemed that they could then, almost hear words, then, cool words, saying something about water Even and though sleep. I don't like doing this, uh, I had to do this because I needed a pet. But now, they gave themselves up to the spell and set, fell fast asleep not really at the foot of, of the great anymore. grey willow. Dodo lay for a while, fighting with the sleep that was overpowering him. Then, with an effort, he struggled to his feet again. He felt a compelling desire for cool water. Oh, wait for me, Sam, he stammered. Must bathe feet a minute. Yeah, yeah I got a small pound. Half in a dream, he wandered forward to the river ward's side I of the tree, where the great winding roots force. grew into the stream, like right. gnarled dragonets straining down to drink. He straddled one of these and paddled his hot feet into the cool brown water. And there he too suddenly fell asleep with his back against the tree. Sam sat down and scratched his head and yawned like a cavern. He was worried. The afternoon was getting late and he thought this sudden sleepiness uncanny. There's more behind this than sun and warm air, he muttered to himself. I don't like this great big tree. I don't trust it. Hark at it, what? singing about sleep now. This won't do at all. He pulled himself to his feet and staggered off to see what had become of the ponies. He found that two had wandered on a good way along the path, and he had just caught them and brought them back towards the others. When he heard two noises, one loud and the other soft but very clear. One was the splash of something heavy falling into the water. <laughs> they are powerful, the other was they are. Like the snick of a lock. When a door quietly uh, closes fast, way too much health off he rushed me. back to the bank. Frodo was in the water, close to the hedge, and a great tree root seemed to be over him and holding him down, but he was not struggling. Sam gripped him by the jacket and dragged him from under the root, and then with difficulty hauled him onto the bank. Almost at once he woke and coughed and spluttered. Do you know, Sam, he said at length, the beastly tree threw me in. I felt it. The big root just twisted around and tipped me in. You were dreaming, I expect, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. You shouldn't sit in such a place if you feel sleepy. But what about the others? Frodo asked. I wonder what sort of dreams they were having. Where well, they ran round to the other side of the tree and then Sam undertook the click they had heard. Pippin had vanished. The crack by which he had laid himself had closed together so that not a chink could be seen. Mary was trapped. Another crack had closed about his waist. His legs lay outside, but the rest of him was inside a dark opening, the edges of which gripped like a pair of pincers. Frodo and Sam beat first upon the tree trunk where Pippin had lain. They then struggled frantically to pull open the jaws of the crack that held poor Merry. It was quite useless. What a foul thing to happen! Oh God. cried Frodo wildly. <laughs> Why did we ever come to this dreadful forest? I wish we were all back in Krakono. <laughs> Kicked the tree with all his strength, took us to his own feet. A hardly perceptible shiver ran through the stream and up to the branches. 
the leaves rustled and whispered, with a sound of now faint and far off laughter. I suppose we haven't got an axe among our luggage, Mr. Frodo? <laughs> asked Sam. I and am I brought a little hatchet for chopping firewood, said Frodo. Managing. That wouldn't be much use. Wait a minute, cried Sam, struck by an idea suggested by firewood. We might do something with fire. We might, said Frodo doubtfully. We might succeed in roasting Pippin alive inside. We might try to hurt or frighten this tree to begin with, said Sam fiercely. If it don't let them go, I'll have it down if I have to ignore it. He ran to the ponies and before long came back with two tinder boxes and a hatchet. Quickly they gathered dry grass and leaves and bits of bark and made a pile of broken twigs and chopped sticks. These they had heaped against the trunk on the far side of the tree for the prisoners. Of course, you can see the power. As soon as Sam had struck a spark into the tinder, it kindled it the dry grass and a flurry of flame and smoke went up. Twigs cackled. Little fingers of fire licked against the dry, scored rind of the ancient tree and scorched it. A tremor ran through the hole below. And the leaves, the leaves seemed to hiss above their heads with the sound of pain and anger. A loud scream came from Mary, and from far inside the tree they heard Pippin give a muffled yell. Put it out! Put it out! Cried Mary. Who? What? Shouted Frodo, rushing round to the corner of the side of the tree. Put it out! begged Mary. The branches of the willow began to sway violently. There was a sound as of a wind rising and spreading outwards to the branches of all the other trees that round about, as though they had dropped a stone into a quiet slumber of the river valley and set up ripples of anger that ran out over the whole forest. Sam kicked at the little fire and stamped out the sparks, but Frodo, without any clear idea of why he did so or what he hoped for, ran along the path crying, Help! 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 It seemed to him that he could hardly hear the sound of his own shrill voice. It was blown away from him by the willow wind and drowned in the clamor of leaves as soon as the words left his mouth. He felt desperate, lost, and witless. Suddenly he stopped. There was an answer, or so he thought, but it seemed to come from behind him, away down the path further back into the forest. He turned round and listened. And soon there could be no doubt. Someone was singing a song. A deep, glad voice was singing carelessly and happily. But it was singing nonsense. Half hopeful and half afraid of some new danger, Frodo and Sam now both stood still. Suddenly, out of a long string of nonsense words, or so they seemed, the a voice rose up loud and clear and burst into the song. Slender as the willow one, clearer as the water. Oh, Tom Bombadil, water lily springing. Come along, hopping home again. Can you hear him ringing? Hey, come, Derry Doll, Derry Doll, a merry o, Goldberry, Goldberry, Mally Yellow Berry o. Poor old willow man, you tuck your roots away. Tom's in a hurry now, evening will follow and, uh, day. Like Tom's going home again, here. water lilies bringing. Hey, come, nary doll, can't you hear oh, me singing? No, Frodo and Sam stood as if enchanted. The wind puffed out, the leaves hung silently again on stiff branches. There was another burst of song, and then suddenly, hopping and dancing along the path, there appeared above the reeds an old battered hat, with a tall crown and a long blue feather stuck into the band. With another hop and a bound there came into view a man, or so it seemed. At any rate he was too large and heavy for a hobbit, if not quite tall enough for one of the big people, though he made noise enough for one, stumping along with great yellow boots on his thick legs and charging through grass and rushes like a cow going down to drink. He had a blue coat and a long brown beard. His eyes were blue and bright, his face was red as a ripe apple, 
but creased into a hundred wrinkles of laughter. In his hands he carried a large leaf as on a stray small pile of white water lilies. Help! cried Frodo and Sam running towards him with their hands stretched out. Whoa, whoa, steady there! cried the old man, holding up one hand, and they stopped short, as if they had been struck stiff. Hmm, now, my little fellows, where be you a-going to, puffin' like the bellows? What's the matter here, then? Do you know who I am? I'm Tom Bombadil. Tell me what's your trouble. Tom's in a hurry now. Don't you crush my lilies. And my friends are caught in the willow tree, uh, cried Frodo breathlessly. Master Mary's been squeezing a crack. What? shouted Tom Bombadil, leaping up the air. Old Val Willow. Not worse than that, eh? Oh, that can soon be mended. I know the tune for him, old Grey Willow Man. I'll freeze his marrow cold if he don't behave himself. I'll sing his roots off. I'll sing a wind up and blow leaf and branch away, old Ran Willow. Setting down his lilies carefully on the grass, he ran to the tree. There he saw Mary's feet still sticking out. The rest had already been drawn further inside. Tom put his mouth to the crack and began singing into it in a low voice. They could not catch the words, but evidently Mary was aroused. His legs began to kick. Tom sprang away, and breaking off a hanging branch, he smote the side of the willow with it. You let them out again, old man, low, he said. And what were you a thinking of? You should not be waking. Eat earth, Dick. Dick. Drink water. Go to sleep. Bombadil is talking. He then seized Mary's feet and drew him out of the suddenly widening crack. There was a tearing creak, and the other crack split open, and out of it Pippin sprang as if he had been kicked. Then with a loud snap, both cracks closed fast again. A shudder ran through the tree, from root to tip, in complete silence fell. Thank you, thank you, said the hobbits one after another. Tom Bombadil burst out laughing. Well, my little fellows, said he, stooping so that he peered into their faces. Hmm. You shall come home with me. The table is all laden with yellow cream, honeycomb, and white bread and butter. Goldberries awaiting. Butter and bread. Time enough for questions around the supper table. You follow after me as quick as you are able. With that, he picked up his lilies, and then with a beckoning That's wave of his hands, went hopping and dancing along the path eastward, still singing loudly and nonsensically. Too surprised and too relieved to talk, the hobbits followed after him as fast as they could. But that was not fast enough. Tom soon disappeared in front of them, and the noise of his singing got fainter and further away. Suddenly his voice came floating back to them with a loud halloo. Hop along, my yellow friends, up the willy window. Tom's going on ahead with candles for to kindle. Down west sinks the sun, but soon you'll be groping. When the night shadows fall, then the door will open. Out from the window panes, light will twinkle yellow. Fear no alder black, heed no hoary willow. Fear neither root nor bow. Tom goes on before you. Hey now, merry doll, we'll be waiting for you. After that, the hobbits heard no more. Almost at once, the sun seemed to sink into the trees behind them. They thought of the slanting light of evening littering into the Brandywine River, and the windows of Bucklebury beginning to gleam with hundreds of lights. Great shadows fell across them. Trunks and branches of trees hung dark and threatening all over the path. White mists began to rise and curl on the surface of the river, and stray about the roots of the trees upon its borders. Out of the very ground at their feet a shadowy steam arose and mingled with the swiftly falling dusk. It became difficult to follow the path, and they were very tired. Their legs seemed laden. Strange furtive noises ran among the bushes and reeds on either side of them, and if they looked up to the pale sky, they caught sight of queer, gnarled and knobby faces that loomed dark against the twilight, and leered down at them from the high bank at the edges of the wood. They began to feel that all this country was unreal and that they were stumbling through an ominous dream that led to no awakening. Just as they felt their feet slowing down to a standstill, they noticed the ground was gently rising. The water began to murmur, 
In the darkness they caught the white glimmer of foam, where the river flowed over a short fall. Then suddenly the trees came to an end, and the mists were left behind. They stepped out from the forest and found a wide sweep of grass welling up before them. The river, now small and swift, was leaping merrily down to meet them, glinting here and there in the light of the stars, which were already shining in the sky. The grass under their feet was smooth and short, as if it had been mown or shaven. The eaves of the forest behind were clipped and thin as a hedge. The path was now plain before them, well tended and bordered with stone. It wound up to the top of a grassy knoll, now grey under the pale starry night, and there, still high above them on a further slope, they saw the twinkling lights of a house. Down again the path went, and then up again, up a long smooth hillside of turf towards the light. Suddenly a wide yellow beam flowed out brightly from a door that was opened. There was Tom Bombadil's house before them, up, down, under hill. Behind it a steep shoulder of the land lay grey and bare, and beyond that the dark shapes of the Barrow Down stalked away to the eastern night. They all hurried forward, hobbits and ponies, already half their weariness, and all their fears had fallen from them. Hey, come, merry doll, rolled out the song to greet them. Hey, come, merry doll, hope will all my hearties. Hobbits, ponies all, we're all fond of parties. Now let the fun begin, let us sing together. Then another clear voice, as young and ancient as spring, like the song of a glad water flowing down into the night from a bright morning in the hills, came falling like silver to meet them. Now let the song begin, let us sing together, so the stars will enlist in cloudy weather, light on the budding leaf, blue on the feather, wind on the open hill, bells on the heather, Reeds by the shady pool, lilies by the water, old Tom Bombadil, and the river daughter. That song, the hobbits stood upon the threshold, and a golden light was all about them. The four hobbits stepped over the wide stone threshold and stood still, blinking. They were in a long low room filled with the light of lamps swinging from beams off the roof, and on the table of dark polished wood stood many candles, tall and yellow, burning brightly. In a chair, at the far side of the room facing the outer door, sat a woman. Her long yellow hair rippled down her shoulders. Her gown was green, green as young reeds, shot with silver like beads of dew and her belt was of gold, shaped like a chain of flag lilies set in the pale blue eyes of forget-me-nots. About her feet, in wide vessels of green and brown earthenware, white water lilies were floating, so that she seemed to be enthroned in the midst of a pool. Enter, good guests, she said, and as she spoke, they knew it was her clear voice they were heard singing. They came a few timid steps further into the room and began to bow low, feeling strangely surprised and awkward, like folk that, knocking at a cottage door to beg for a drink of water, had been answered by a fair young elf queen clad in living flowers. But before they could say anything, she sprang lightly up and over the lily bowls and ran laughing towards them, and as she ran, her gown rustled softly like the wind in the flowering borders of a river. <laughs> Dear folk, she said, taking Frodo by the hand, laugh and be merry. I am Goldberry, daughter of the river. Then lightly she passed them, and closing the door, she turned her back to it, with her white arms spread out across it. Let us shut out the night, she said, for you are still afraid, perhaps, of mist and tree shadows and deep water and untamed things. Fear nothing, for tonight you are under the roof of Tom Bombadil. The hobbits looked at her in wonder, and she looked at each of them and smiled. Fair Lady Goldberry, said Frodo at last, feeling his heart moved with a joy that he did not understand. He stood as he had at times stood enchanted by fair elven voices, but the spell that was now laid upon him was different. 
Less keen and lofty was the delight, but deeper and nearer to the mortal heart. Marvellous, and yet not strange. Fair Lady Goldberry, he said again, now the joy that was hidden in the songs we heard is made plain to me. O oh, slender as the willow wand, O oh, clearer than clear water, O oh, reed by the living pool, fair river daughter, O oh, springtime and summertime, and spring again after, O oh, wind on the waterfall and leaves laughter. Suddenly he stopped and stammered, uh, overcome with his surprise to hear himself saying such things, but Goldberry laughed. <laughs> Welcome, she said. I have not heard that folk of the shy was so sweet-tongued, but I see you are an elf friend. The light in your eyes and the ring in your voice tells it. It is a merry meeting. Sit now, sit and wait for the master in the house. He will not be long. He has tended your tired beasts. The hobbits sat down gladly in low, rush-seated chairs, while Goldberry busied herself around the table, and their eyes followed her, for the slender grace of her movement filled them with quiet delight. From somewhere behind the house came a sound of singing. Every now and again they caught among many a derry dole and merry dole and ring a ding and dillo the repeated words Old Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow. Bright blue is jacketed, and his boots are yellow. Fair lady, said Frodo again after a while, tell me if my asking does not seem foolish. Who is Tom Bombadil? He is, said Goldberry, staying her swift movements and smiling. Frodo looked at her questioningly. He is as you have seen him, she said in answer to his look. He is the master of the wood, water and hill. Th then all this strange land belongs to him. No, indeed, she answered, and her smile faded. That would indeed be a burden, she added in a low voice, as if to herself. The trees and the grasses and all things growing or living in the land belong to each of themselves. Tom Bombadil is the master. No one has ever caught old Tom walking in the forest, wading in the water, leaping on the hilltops under the light and shadow. He has no fear. Tom Bombadil is master. A door opened and in came Tom Bombadil. He had now no hat and his thick brown hair was covered with autumn leaves. He laughed, and going to Goldberry, took her hand. <laughs> Here's my pretty lady, he said, bowing to the hobbits. Here's my Goldberry, clothed all in silver green, with flowers in her griddle. Here's the table, Adam. I see yellow cream and honeycomb and white bread and butter, milk cheese and green herbs and ripe berries gathered. Is that enough for us? Is the supper ready? It is, said Goldberry. But the guests perhaps are not. Oh. Tom clapped his hands and cried, Tom, Tom, your guests are tired and all, and you had near forgotten. Come now, merry friends, and Tom will refresh you. You shall clean grimy hands and wash your weary faces. Cast off your muddy cloaks and comb out your tangles. He opened the door and they folded him down the short passage and round a sharp turn. They came to a low room with a sloping roof, a penthouse it seemed, built on the north end of the house. Its walls were of clean stone, but they were mostly covered with green hanging mats with yellow curtains. The floor was flagged and strewn with fresh green rushes. There were four deep mattresses, each piled with white blankets laid on the floor along one side. Against the opposite wall was a long bench laden with white earthenware basins and beside it stood brown ewers filled with water, some cold, some steaming hot. There were soft green slippers set ready beside each bed. Before long, washed and refreshed, the hobbits were seated at the table, two on each side, while at either end sat Goldberry and the master. It was a long and merry meal. Though the hobbits ate as only famished hobbits can eat, there was no lack. The drink in their drinking bowl seemed to be clear cold water, Yet it went to their hearts like wine and set free their voices. The guests became suddenly aware that they were singing merrily, as if it was easier and more natural than talking. At last, Tom and Goldberry rose and cleared the table swiftly. The guests were commanded to sit quiet, and were set with chairs, each with a footstool to his tired feet. There was a fire in the wide hearth before them, 
and it was burning with a sweet smell, as if it were built of apple wood. When everything was set in order, all the lights in the room were put out, except one lamp and a pair of candles at each end of the chimney shelf. Then Goldberry came and stood before them, holding a candle, and she wished them each a good night and deep sleep. Have peace now, she said, until the morning. Heed no nightly noises, for nothing passes door and window here save moonlight and starlight, and the wind off the hilltop. Good night. She passed out of the room with a glimmer and a rustle. The sound of her footsteps was like a stream falling gently away downhill over cool stones with the quiet of night. Tom sat on a while beside them in silence, while each of them tried to muster the courage to ask one of the many questions they had meant to ask at supper. Sleep gathered on their eyelids. At last Frodo spoke. Did you hear me calling, Master? Or was it just chance that brought you at that moment? Tom stirred like a man shaken out of an unpleasant dream. Hey, mm, what? said he. Did I hear you calling? Nay, I did not hear. I was busy singing. Just chance brought me in then, if chance you call it. Hi, <laughs> it was no plan of mine, though I was waiting for you. We heard news of you and learned that you were wondering. We guessed you'd come here long down the water, all past lead that way, down to the wavy windle. Old Ray Willow Man, he's a mighty singer, and it's hard for little folk to escape his cunning mazes. But Tom had an errand there that he dared not hinder. Tom nodded, as if sleep was taking him again, but he went on in a soft singing voice. I had an errand there, gathering water lilies, green leaves and lilies white to please my pretty lady. The last year the year's end to keep them from the winter, to flower by their pretty feet till the sound snows are melted. Each year at summer's end I go to find them for her, in our wide pool deep and clear far down the windy window. There they open first in spring, and there they linger latest. By that pool long ago I found the river daughter, fair young Goldberry sitting in the rushes. Sweet was her singing then, and her heart was beating. He opened his eyes and looked at them with sudden glint of blue. And that proved well for you, for now I shall no longer Go down deep again along the forest water. Not while the year is old, nor shall I be passing. Old Man Willow's house is side is of springtime, not till the merry spring, when the river daughter dances down the worthy path to bathe in the water. He fell silent again, but Frodo could not help asking one more question. The one that most desired to have answered. Tell us, master, he said, about the willow man. What is he? I've never heard of him before. No, don't, don't said Mary and Pippin together, sitting suddenly upright. Not now, not until the morning. Oh, that is right, said the old man. Now is the time for resting. Some things are ill to hear when the world's in shadow. Sleep till the morning light. Lest on the pillow, heed no nightly noise, fear no grey willow. And with that he took down the lamp and blew it out, and grasping a candle in either hand, he led them out of the room. Their mattresses and pillows were soft as, were soft as down, and the blankets were of white wool. They had hardly laid themselves on the deep beds and drawn the light covers over them before they were asleep. In the dead night, Frodo lay in a dream without light. Then he saw the young moon rising. Under its thin light there loomed before him a black wall of rock, pierced by a dark arch like a great gate. It seemed to Frodo that he was lifted up, and passing over he saw that the rock wall was the circle of hills, and that within it was a plain, and in the midst of the plain stood a pinnacle of stone, like a vast tower but not made by hands. On its top stood the figure of a man, 
The moon as it rose seemed to hang for a moment above his head and glistened in his white hair as the wind stirred it. Up from the dark lane below came the crying of fell voices and the howling of many wolves. Suddenly a shadow like the shape of great wings passed across them. The figure lifted his arms and a light flashed from the staff that he wielded. A mighty eagle swept down and bore him away. The voices wailed and the wolves yammered. There was a noise like a strong wind blowing, and on it was borne the sound of hoofs galloping, galloping from the east. Black riders, thought Frodo, as he wakened, with the sound of the hoofs still echoing in his mind. He wondered if he would ever again have the courage to leave the safety of these stone walls. He lay motionless, still listening, but all was now silent. And at last he turned and fell asleep again and wandered into some other unremembered dream. At his side, Pippin lay dreaming pleasantly, but a change came over his dreams, and he turned and groaned. Suddenly he woke, or, th or thought he had waked, and yet still heard in the darkness the sound that had disturbed his dream. The noise was like branches fretting in the wind, twig fingers scraping wall and window. He wondered if there were willow trees close to the house, and then suddenly he had a dreadful feeling that he was not in an ordinary house at all, but inside the willow, and listening to that horrible dry creaking voice laughing at him again. He sat up and felt the soft pillows yield to his hands, and he lay down again relieved. He seemed to hear the echo of words in his ears. Then he went to sleep again. It was the sound of water that Mary heard falling into his quiet sleep, water streaming down gently and then spreading and spreading irresistibly all around the house into a dark, shoreless pool. It gurgled under the walls and was rising slowly but surely. I shall be drowned, he thought. It will find its way in, and then I shall drown. He felt that he was lying in a soft, slimy bog, and springing up, he set his foot on the corner of a cold, hard flagstone. Then he remembered where he was and lay down again. He seemed to hear or remember hearing. Nothing passes doors or windows save the moonlight and starlight and the wind off the hilltop. A little breath of sweet air moved the curtain. He breathed deep and fell asleep again. As far as he could remember, Sam slept through the night in a deep content. If logs are contented. They woke up, all four at once, in the morning light. Tom was moving about the room, whistling like a starling. When he heard them stir, he clapped his hands and cried, Hey, come, merry doll, dairy doll, my hearties. He drew back the yellow curtains, and the hobbit saw that these had covered the windows at either end of the room, one looking east and the other looking okay, west. So killing, uh, they leapt up refreshed. Frodo ran to the eastern window and found himself looking into a kitchen garden, grey with dew. He had half expected to see turf right up to the walls. Turf all pocked with hoof prints. Actually, his view was screened by a tall line of beams on poles. But above and far beyond them, the grey top of the hill loomed up against the sunrise. It was a pale morning. In the east, behind the long clouds like lines of foiled wool, stained red at the edges, lay glimmering deeps of yellow. The sky spoke of rain to come, but the light was broadening quickly, and the red flowers of the beans began to glow against the wet green leaves. Pippin looked out of the western window, down into a pool of mist. The forest was hidden under a fog. It was like looking down onto a sloping cloud roof from above. There was a fold or channel where the mist was broken into many plumes and billows, the valley of the Withy Windle. The stream ran down the hill of the left and vanished into the white shadows. Near at hand was a flower garden, and a clipped hedge silver netted, and beyond that grey shaven grass pale with dewdrops. There was no willow tree to be seen. Good morning, merry friends, cried Tom, opening the eastern window wide. A cool air flowed in. It had a rainy smell. Sun won't show her face much today, I'm thinking. I have been walking wide, leaping on the hilltops since the grey dawn began, nosing wind and weather, 
Wet grass underfoot, wet sky above me. Uh, I wake in Goldberry, singing under window. But not wake up at folk in the early morning. Down more than one in the, the night, little folk it, wake up in the darkness and sleep after light has come. Three, Ring a ding a dillo! Wake now, my merry friends, forget the nightly noises. Ring a ding dillo dell, nary dell, my hearties. If you come soon, you'll find breakfast on the table. If you come late, you'll get grass and rainwater. Needless to say, not that Tom's threat sounded very serious, the hobbits came soon, and left the table late and only when it was beginning to look rather empty. Neither Tom nor Goldberry were there. Tom could be heard about the house, clattering in the kitchen, and up and down the stairs, and singing the here and there outside. The room looked westward over the mist-clouded valley, and the window was open. Water dripped down from the thatched eaves above. Before they had finished breakfast, the clouds had joined into an unbroken roof, and a straight grey rain came softly and steadily down. Behind its deep curtain, the forest was completely veiled. As they looked out of the window, there came falling gently as if it was flowing down the rain out of the sky, the clear voice of Goldberry singing up above them. They could hear few words, but it seemed plain to them that the song was a rain song as sweet as showers on dry hills, that told the tale of a river from the spring in the highlands to the sea far below. The hobbits listened with delight, and Frodo was glad in his heart, and blessed the kindly weather, because it delayed them from departing. The thought of going had been heavy upon him from the moment he awoke, but he guessed now that they would not go further that day. The upper wind settled in the west, and deeper and wetter clouds rolled up to spill their laden rain on the bare heads of the downs. Nothing could be seen all around the house but falling water. Frodo stood near the open door and watched the white chalky path turn to a little river of milk and go bubbling away down into the valley. Tom Bombadil came trotting round the corner of the house, waving his arms as he was warding off the rain, and indeed, when he sprang over the threshold, he seemed quite dry, except for his boots. These he took off and put in the chimney corner. Then he sat in the largest chair and called gather the hobbits to gather around him. This is Goldberry's washing day, he said, and her autumn cleaning. Too wet for hobbit folk, yet them rest while they are able. It's a good day for long tales, for questions and for answers, so Tom will start the talking. He then told them many remarkable stories, sometimes half as if speaking to himself, sometimes looking at them suddenly with a bright blue eye under his deep brows. Often his voice would turn to song, and he would get out of his chair and dance about. He told them tales of bees and flowers, the ways of trees, and the strange creatures of the forest, about the evil things and good things, things friendly and things unfriendly, cruel things and kind things and secrets hidden under brambles. As they listened, they began to understand the lives of the forest apart from themselves, indeed to feel themselves as the strangers where all other things were all her tone. Moving constantly in and out of this talk was Old Man Willow, and Frodo learned now enough to content him, indeed more than enough, for it was not comfortable at all. Tom's words laid bare the hearts of trees and their thoughts, which were often dark and strange, and filled with a hatred of things that go free upon the earth gnawing, biting, breaking, hacking, and burning, destroyers and usurpers. It was not called the old forest without a reason, for it was indeed ancient, a survivor of vast forgotten woods, and in it there lived yet, aging no quicker than the hills, the fathers of the fathers of trees, remembering times when they were lords. The countless years had filled them with pride and rooted wisdom and with malice. But none were more dangerous than the great willow. His heart was rotten, but his strength was green, and he was cunning, and the master of winds. And his song and thought ran through the woods on both sides of the river. His grey, thirsty spirit drew power out of the earth and spread like fine root threads in the ground, and invisible twig fingers in the air till it had under its dominion nearly all the trees of the forest, from the hedge to the downs. Suddenly Tom's talk left the woods and went leaping up the young stream, over bubbling waterfalls, over pebbles and worn rocks, and among small flowers and close grass and wet crannies, wandering at last up on to the downs. 
They heard of the great barrows, and the green mountains, and the stone rings upon the hills, and in the hollows among the hills. Sheep were bleating in flocks, green walls and white walls rose. There were fortresses on the heights. Kings of little kingdoms fought together, and the young sun shone like fire on the red metal of their new and greedy swords. There was victory and defeat. The towers fell, fortresses were burned, and flames went up into the sky. Gold was piled on the byres of dead kings and queens, and mounds covered them. And the stone doors were shut, and the grass grew over all. Sheep walked for a while, biting the grass, but soon the hills were empty again. A shadow came out of dark places far away, and the bones were stirred in the mounds. Barrow whites walked in the hollow places with a clink of rings on cold fingers and gold chains in the wind. Stone rings grinned out of the ground like broken teeth in the moonlight. The hobbits shuddered. Even in the Shire, the rumours of the Barrow Whites of the Barrow Downs beyond the forest had been heard. But it was not a tale that any hobbit liked to listen to, even by a comfortable fireside far away. These four now suddenly remembered what the joy of this house had driven from their minds. The house of Tom Bombadil nested under the very shoulder of those dreaded hills. They lost the thread of his tail and shifted uneasily looking aside at one another. When they called his words again, they found that he had now wandered into strange regions beyond their memory and beyond their waking thought, into times when the world was wider and the seas flowed straight into the western shore. And still on and back, Tom went singing out into the ancient starlight, when only the elf sires were awake. Then suddenly he stopped, and he saw that he nodded as if he were falling asleep. The hobbit sat still before him, enchanted, and it seemed as if under the spell of his words the wind had gone, and the clouds had dried up, and the day had been withdrawn, and darkness had come from east and west, and all the sky was filled with the light of white stars. Whether the morning and evening of one day or of many days had passed, Frodo could not tell. He did not feel either hungry or tired, only filled with wonder. The stars shone through the window and the silence of the heavens seemed to be round him. He spoke at last, out of his wonder and sudden fear that silence. Who are you, master? He asked. <laughs> eh? What? Said Tom, sitting up and his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you, alone, yourself and nameless? But you are young, and I am old. Eldest, that's what I am. Mark my words, my friends. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. He made paths before the big people and saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves of the Barrow Whites. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already. Before the seas were bent, he knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless, before the Dark Lord came from outside. A shadow seemed to pass by the window, and the hobbits glanced hastily through the panes. When they turned again, Goldberry stood in the door behind, framed in the light. She held a candle, shielding its flame from the draught in her hand, and the light flowed through it, like sunlight through a white shell. The rain has ended, she said. And new waters are running downhill under the stars. Let us now laugh and be glad. And then let us have food and drink, cried Tom. Long tails are thirsty, and long listening is hungry work. Morning, noon, and evening. Oh. With that, he jumped out of his chair and with a bound took a candle from the chimney shelf and lit it in the flame that Goldberry held. Then he danced about the table. Suddenly, he hopped through the door and disappeared. Quickly, he returned, bearing a large and laden tray. Then Tom and Goldberry set the table, and the hobbits sat half in wonder and half in laughter. So fair was the grace of Goldberry, and so merry and odd that the caperings of Tom, yet in some fashion they seemed to weave a single dance, neither hindering the other, in and out of the room, and round about the table. And with great speed, food and vessels and lights were set in order. The boards blazed with candles white and yellow. Tom bowed to his guests. Supper is ready!
washed forget-me-nots, and he had green stockings. It was a supper even better than before. The hobbits, under the spell of Tom's words, may have missed one meal or many, but when the food was before them, it seemed at least a week since they had eaten. They did not sing or even speak much for a while, and paid close attention to business. But after a time, their hearts and spirits rose high again, and their voices rang out in mirth and laughter. After they had eaten, Goldberry sang many songs for them, songs that began merrily in the hills and fell softly down into silence. And in the silences they saw in their minds pools and waters wider than any they had known. And looking into them, they saw the sky below them, and the stars like jewels in the depths. Then once more she wished them each good night, and left them by the fireside. But Tom now seemed wide awake, and plied them with questions. He appeared already to know much about them and all their families, and indeed to know much of all the history and doings of the Shire, down from nays hardly remembered among the hobbits themselves. It no longer surprised them, but he made no secret that he owed his recent knowledge largely to Farmer Maggot, whom he seemed to regard as a person of more importance than they had imagined. There's earth under his old feet, and clay on his fingers, wisdom in his bones, and both his eyes are open, said Tom. It was also clear that Tom had dealings with the elves, and it seemed that in some fashion news had reached him from Gildor concerning the flight of Frodo. Indeed, so much did Tom know, and so cunning was his questioning, that Frodo found himself telling him more about Bilbo and his own hopes and fears than he had, that he had told before, even to Gandalf. Tom wagged his head up and down, and there was a glint in his eyes when he heard of the riders. Show me the precious ring, he said suddenly in the midst of the story. And Frodo, to his own astonishment, drew out the chain from his pocket, and unfastening the ring, handed it at once to Tom. It, it seemed to grow Tom's larger as it lay for a moment on his big brown skinned hand. Then suddenly, be, uh, he put it to his eye and pain. laughed. For a second, the hobbits had a vision, both comical and alarming, of his bright blue eye gleaming through a circle of gold. Then Tom put the ring round the end of his little finger and held it up to the candlelight. For a moment, the hobbits noticed nothing strange about this. Then they gasped. There was no sign of Tom disappearing. Tom laughed again, and then he spun the ring in the air, and it vanished with a flash. Frodo gave a cry, and Tom leaned forward and handed it back to him with a smile. Hmm. Frodo looked at it closely and rather suspiciously, like one who has lent a trinket to a juggler. It was the same ring, or looked the same and weighed the same. That ring had always seemed to Frodo to weigh strangely heavy in the hand. But something prompted him to make sure. He was perhaps a trifle annoyed with Tom for seeming to make so light of what even Gandalf thought so perilously important. He waited for an opportunity. When the talk was going on again, and Tom was telling an absurd story about badgers and their queer ways, then he slipped the ring on. Mary turned towards him to say something and gave a start, and checked an exclamation. Frodo was delighted, in a way. It was his own ring all right, for Mary was staring blankly at his chair and obviously could not see him. He got up and crept quietly away from the fireside towards the outer door. Hey there, cried Tom, glancing towards him with the most seeing look in his shining eyes. Hey, come Frodo there, where be you a going? Old Tom Bombadil's not as blind as that yet. Take off your golden ring, your hands more fair without it. Come back, leave your game and sit down beside me. We must talk a little while more and think of the morning. Tom must teach the right road and keep your feet from wandering. Frodo laughed, <laughs> trying to feel pleased and taking off the ring, he came and sat down again. Tom now told them that he reckoned the sun would shine tomorrow, and it would be a glad morning, and setting out would be hopeful. But they would not okay, do well to start uh, early, for weather in that country was a thing that even Tom could not be sure of for long, and it would change some time, quicker than he could change his jacket. I, don't want to deal with thunder. I am no weather master, he said, nor is up that goes on two legs. By his advice, they decided to make early due north from his house, over the western and lower slopes of the Downs. They might hope in that way to strike the East Road, in a day's journey and avoid the barrows. He told them not to be afraid, but to mind their own business. Keep on the green grass. Don't you go a meddling with old stone or coal whites or prying in their houses, unless you be strong folk with hearts that never falter. He said this more than once 
and he advised them to pass barrows by on the west side if they chanced to stray near one. Then he taught them a rhyme to sing. If they should, by ill luck, fall into any danger or difficulty the next day. Oh, Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadil, oh, by water, wood, and hill, <coughs> by the reed and willow, by fire, sun, moon, and hearken now and hear us. Come, Tom Bombadil, for our need is near us. When they had sung this to all together after him, he clapped them each on the shoulder with a laugh, and taking candles, led them back to their bedroom. I do like Tom Bombadil. He's born on the earth and... Uh, that night, they heard no noises. But either in his dreams or out of them, he could not tell which. Frodo heard a sweet singing running in his mind. A song that seemed to come like a pale light behind a grey rain curtain, uh, and growing stronger to turn yeah, the veil all always. to glass and silver, until at last it was rolled back, and a far green country opened before him under a swift sunrise. The vision melted into waking, and there was Tom whistling, like a tree full of birds, and the sun was already slanting down the hill and through the open window. Outside, everything was green and pale gold. After breakfast, which they again ate alone, they made ready to say farewell, as nearly heavy of heart as was possible on such a morning, cool, bright, and clear under a washed autumn sky of thin blue. The air came fresh from the northwest. Their quiet ponies were almost frisky, sniffing and moving restlessly. Tom came out of the house and waved his hat and danced upon the doorstep, bidding the hobbits to get up and be off and go with good speed. They rode off along a path that went away from behind the house and went slanting up towards the north end of the hill brow under which it sheltered. They had just dismounted to lead their ponies up the vast steep slope when suddenly Frodo stopped. Goldberry, he cried, my fair lady clad all in silver green, we have never said farewell to her, nor seen her since the evening. He was so distressed that he turned back, but at that moment a clear coal came rippling down. There on the hill brow she stood, beckoning to them. Her hair was flying loose, and as it caught the sun it shone and shimmered. A light, like the glint of water on dewy grass, flashed from under her feet as she danced. They hastened up the last slope and stood breathless beside her. They bowed, but with a wave of her arm she bade them look around, and they looked out from the hilltop over lands under the morning. It was now as clear and far seen as it had been, veiled and misty when they stood upon the knoll in the forest, which would now be seen rising pale and green out of the dark trees in the west. In that direction the land rose in wooden ridges, green, yellow, russet under the sun, beyond which lay hidden the valley of the Brandywine. To the south, over the line of the Withy Windle, there was a distant glint, like pale glass, where the Brandywine River made a great loop in the lowlands and flowed away out of the knowledge of the hobbits. Northward beyond the dwindling downs, the land ran away in flats and dwelling of grey and green and pale earth colours, until it faded into a featureless and shadowy distance. Eastward, the Barrow Downs rose, ridge behind ridge into the morning, and vanished out of the eyesight into a guess. It was no more than a guess of blue and a remote white glimmer, blending with the hem of the sky, but it spoke to them, out of memory and old tales of the high and distant mountains. They took a deep draught of air, and felt that a skip and a few stout rides would bear them wherever they wished. It seemed faint-hearted to go jogging aside over the crumpled skirts of the downs towards the road, where they should be leaping, as lusty as Tom, over the stepping stones of the hills straight towards the mountains. Goldberry spoke to them and recalled their eyes and thoughts. Speed now, fair guests, she said. And hold to your purpose, north with the wind in the left eye, and a blessing on your footsteps. Make haste while the sun shines. And to Frodo she said, Farewell, elf friend. It was a merry meeting. But Frodo found no words to answer. He bowed low, and mounted his pony, and followed by his friends, jogged slowly down the gentle slope behind the hill. Tom Bombadil's house and the valley and the forest were lost to view. The air grew warmer between the green walls of hillside and hillside, and the scent of turf rose strong and sweet as they breathed. Turning back, when they reached the bottom of the green hollow, 
they saw Goldberry, now small and slender, like a sunlit flower against the sky. She was standing still, watching them, and her hands were stretched out towards them. As they looked, she gave a clear call, and lifting up her hand, she turned and vanished behind the hill. Their way round along the floor of the hollow, and round the green feet of a steep hill into another deeper and broader valley, and then over the shoulder of further hills, and down their long limbs, and up their smoother sides again, up on new hilltops, and down into new valleys. There was no tree nor any visible water. It was a country of grass, and short springy turf, silent except for the whisper of the air over the hedges of the land, and high lonely cries of strange birds. As they journeyed, the sun mounted and grew hot. Each time they climbed the ridge, the breeze seemed to have grown less. When they caught a glimpse of the country westward, the distant forest seemed to be smoking, as if the fallen rain was steaming up again from leaf and root and mould. A shadow now lay round the edge of sight, a dark haze above which the upper sky was like a blue cap, hot and heavy. About midday, they came to a hill whose top was wide and flattened, like a shallow saucer with a green mounded rim. Inside, there was no air stirring, and the sky seemed near their heads. They rode across and looked northwards. Then their hearts rose, for it seemed plain that they had come further already than they had expected. Certainly, the distances had now all become hazy and deceptive, but there could be no doubt that the downs were coming to an end. A long valley lay below them, winding away northwards until it came to an opening between two steep shoulders. Beyond, there seemed to be no more hills. Due north, they faintly glimpsed a long dark line. That is a line of trees, said Mary, and that must mark the road. All along it, for many leagues east of the bridge, there are trees growing. Some say they were planted in the old days. Splendid, said Frodo. If you make as good going this afternoon as you've done this morning, we shall have left the downs before the sun sets and be jogging on in search for a camping place. But even as he spoke, he turned his glance eastwards, and he saw that on the side the hills were higher, and looked down upon them, and all those hills were crowned with green mounds and on some were standing stones, pointing upwards like jagged teeth out of green gums. That view was somehow disquieting, for they turned from the site and went down into the hollow circle. In the midst of it there stood a single stone, standing tall under the sun above, and at its hour casting no shadow. It was shapeless and yet significant, like a landmark or a guarding finger, or more like a warning. But they were now hungry, and the sun was still at the fearless noon, so they set their packs against the east side of the stone. It was cool, as if the sun had no power to warm it, but at that time it seemed pleasant. There they took food and drink, and made as good a noon meal under the open sky as anyone could wish, for the food came from down under hill. Tom had provided them with plenty for the comfort of the day. Their ponies under burden strayed upon the grass, riding over the hills and eating their fill, the warm sun and the scent of turf, lying a little too long, stretching out their legs and looking at the sky above their noses, these things are, perhaps, enough to explain what happened. However that may be, they woke suddenly and uncomfortably from a sleep they never meant to take. The standing stone was cold, and it cast a long pale shadow that stretched eastward over them. The sun, a pale and watery yellow, was gleaming through the mist just above the west wall of the hollow in which they lay. North, south, and east, beyond the wall the fog was thick, cold, and white. The air was silent, heavy, and chill. Their ponies were standing crowded together with their heads down. The hobbits sprang to their feet in alarm, and ran to the western rim. They found that they were upon an island in the fog. Even as they looked out in dismay towards the setting sun, it sank before their eyes into a white sea, and a cold grey shadow sprang up in the east behind. The fog rolled up to the walls and rose above them, and as it mounted it bent over their heads until it became a roof. They were shut in a hole of mist, whose central pillar was the standing stone. They felt as if a trap was closing in about them, but they did not quite lose heart. 
They still remembered the hopeful view they had had on the line of the road ahead, and they still knew in which direction it lay. In any case, they now had so great a dislike for that hollow place above the stone that no thought of remaining there was in their minds. They packed up as quickly as their chilled fingers could work. Soon they were leading their ponies in single file over the rim and down the long northward slope of the hill, down into a foggy sea. As they went down, the mist became colder and damper, and their hair hung lank and dripping on their foreheads. When they reached the bottom, it was so cold that they halted and got out cloaks and hoods, which soon became bedewed with grey drops. Then, mounting their ponies, they went slowly on again, feeling their way by the rise and fall of the ground. They were steering, as well as they could guess, for the gate-like opening at the far northward end of the long valley, which they had seen in the morning. Once they were through the gap, they had only to keep on in anything like a straight line and they were bound in the end to strike the road. Their thoughts did not go beyond that, except for a vague hope that perhaps away beyond the downs there might be no fog. Their going was very slow. To prevent their getting separated and wandering in different directions, they went in file, with Frodo leading. Sam was behind him, and after him came Pippin and Merry. The valley seemed to stretch on endlessly. Suddenly Frodo saw a hopeful sign. On either side ahead, a darkness began to gloom through the mist, and he guessed that they were at last approaching the gap in the hills, the north gate of the Barrow Downs. If they could pass that, they would be free. Come on! Follow me! He called back over his shoulder, and he hurried forward, but his hope soon changed to bewilderment and alarm. The dark patches grew darker, but they shrank. And suddenly he saw, towering ominous before him, and leaning slightly towards one another like the pillars of a headless door, two huge standing stones. He could not remember having seen any sign of these in the valley when he looked out from the hill in the morning. He had passed between them almost before he was aware, and even as he did so, darkness seemed to fall around him. His pony reared and snorted and he fell off. When he looked back he found that he was alone and the others had not followed him. Sam! He called. Pippin! Mary! Come along! Well, why don't you keep up? There was no answer. Fear took him, and he ran back past the stones, shouting wildly. Sam! Sam! Mary! Pippin! Yeah, that looks good. The pony bolted into the mist and vanished. From some way off, or so it seemed, he thought he heard a cry. It was away eastward on his left as he stood under the grey stones, staring and straining into the gloom. He plunged off in the direction of the call and found himself going steeply uphill. As he struggled on he called again and kept on calling more and more frantically, but he heard no answer for some time, and then it seemed faint and far ahead and high above him. Came the thin voice out of the mist, and then a cry that sounded like, help, help, often repeated ending with the last, help. That trailed off into a long wail, suddenly cut short. He stumbled forward with all the speed he could towards the cries, but the light was now gone, and clinging night had closed about him, so that it was impossible to be sure of any direction. He seemed all the time to be climbing up and up. Only the change in the level of the ground at his feet told him where he last came into the top of a ridge or hill. He was wary sweating and yet chilled. It was wholly dark. Where are you? He cried out miserably. There was no reply. He stood listening. He was suddenly aware that it was getting very cold and that up here a wind was beginning to blow. An icy wind. A change was coming in the weather. The mist was flowing past him now in shreds and tatters. His breath was smoking, and the darkness was less near and thick. He looked up and saw with surprise that faint stars were appearing overhead amid the strands of hurrying cloud and fog. The wind began to hiss over the grass. He imagined suddenly that he caught a muffled cry, and he made towards it, and even as he went forward the mist was rolled up and thrust aside, and the starry sky was unveiled. A glance showed him that he was now facing southwards, and was on a round hilltop, which he must have climbed from the north. Out of the east, the biting wind was blowing. To his right, there loomed against the westward stars a dark black shape. 
A great barrow stood there. Oh, come on. Where are you? He cried again, both angry and afraid. Yeah, said a voice, deep and cold, that seemed to come out of the ground. I am waiting for you. No! Said Frodo, but he did not run away. His knees gave and he fell on the ground. Nothing happened, and there was no sound. Trembling, he looked up in time to see a tall, dark figure like a shadow against the stars. It leaned over him. He thought there were two eyes, very cold, though lit with a pale light that seemed to come from some remote distance. Then a grip, stronger and colder than iron, seized him. The icy touch froze his bones and he remembered no more. When he came to himself again, for a moment he could recall nothing except a sense of dread. Then suddenly he knew that he was imprisoned, caught hopelessly. He was in a barrow. A barrow white had taken him, and he was probably already under the dreadful spells of the barrow whites, about which whispered tales spoke. He dared not move, but lay as he found himself, flat on his back upon a cold stone with his hands on his breast. But though his fear was so great that it seemed to be part of the very darkness that was around him, he found himself as he lay thinking about Bilbo Baggins and his stories, and of their jogging along together in the lanes of the Shire, and walking about the roads and adventures. There is a seed of courage hidden, often deeply, it is true, in the heart of the fattest and most timid hobbit, waiting for some final and desperate danger to make it grow. Frodo was neither very fat nor very timid, Indeed, though he did not know it, Bilbo and Gandalf had thought him the best hobbit in the Shire. He thought he had come to the end of his adventure, and a terrible end. But the thought hardened him. He found himself stiffening, as if for a final spring. He no longer felt limp like a helpless prey. As he lay there, thinking and getting a hold of himself, he noticed all at once that the darkness was slowly giving way. A pale greenish light was growing round him. It did not at first show him what kind of a place he was in, for the light seemed to be coming out of himself and from the floor beside him, and had not yet reached the roof or wall. He turned, and there in the cold glow he saw lying beside him Sam, Pippin, and Mary. They were on their backs, and their faces looked deathly pale, and they were clad in white. About them lay many treasures, of gold maybe, though in that light they looked cold and unlovely. On their heads were circlets, gold chains were about their waists, and on their fingers were many rings. Swords lay by their sides, and shields were at their feet, but across their three necks lay one long naked sword. Suddenly a song began, a cold murmur rising and falling. The voice seemed far away and immeasurably dreary sometimes high in the air and thin, sometimes like a low moan on the ground. Out of the formless stream of sad but horrible sounds, strings of words could now and again shape themselves. Grim, hard, cold words, heartless and miserable. The night was railing against the morning of which it was bereaved, and the cold was cursing the warmth for which it hungered. Frodo was chilled to the marrow. After a while the song became clearer, and with dread in his heart he perceived that it had changed into an incantation. and scraping sound. Raising himself on one arm, he looked and saw now in the pale light that they were in a kind of passage which behind them turned a corner. Round the corner, a long arm was groping, walking on its fingers towards Sam, who was lying nearest, and towards the hilt of the sword that lay upon him. 
At first, Frodo felt as if he had indeed been turned into stone by the incantation. Then a wild thought of escape came to him. He wondered if he put on the ring, whether the Barrowite would miss him, and he might find some way out. He thought of himself running free over the grass, grieving for Merry and Sam and Pippin, but free and alive himself. Gandalf would admit that there had been nothing else he could do. But the courage that had been awakened in him was now too strong. He could not leave his friend so easily. He wavered, groping in his pocket, and then fought with himself again. And as he did so, the arm crept nearer. Suddenly, a resolve hardened in him, and he seized the short sword that lay beside him, and kneeling, he stooped low over the bodies of his companions. With what strength he had, he hewed at the crawling arm near the wrist, and the hand broke off. But at the same moment, the sword splintered up to the hilt. There was a shriek, and the light vanished. In the dark, there was a snarling noise. Frodo fell forward over Mary, and Mary's face felt cold. All at once, back into his mind, from which it had disappeared with the first coming of the fog, came the memory of the house down under the hill, and of Tom singing. He remembered the rhyme that Tom had taught them. In a small, desperate voice, he began, Oh, Tom Bombadil. And with that name, his voice seemed to grow strong. It had a full and lively sound, and the dark chamber echoed as if to a drum and trumpet. Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadil, oh, by water, wood, and hill, by the reed and willow, by, by fire, sun, and moon, hearken now and hear us. Come, Tom Bombadil, for our need is near us. There was a sudden deep silence in which Frodo could hear his heart beating. After a long, slow moment, he heard plain, but far away, as if it was coming down through the ground or through thick walls, an answering voice singing, Oh, Tom Bombadil, he's a merry fellow, Life through his jacket, and his boots are yellow. John has ever taught him yet, for Tom is the master. His songs are strong and strong, and his feet are faster. There was a loud rumbling sound as of stones rolling and falling, and suddenly light streamed in. Real light, the plain light of day. A low door-like opening appeared at the end of the chamber beyond Frodo's feet, and there was Tom's head, hat, feather and all, framed against the light of the sun, rising red behind him. The light fell upon the floor, and upon the faces the three hobbits lying beside Frodo. They did not stir, but the sickly hue had left them. They looked now as if they were only very deeply asleep. Tom stooped, removed his hat, and came into the dark chambers singing, Get out, you old white, vanish in the sunlight, shiver like the cold mist, like the winds go wailing, out into the barren lands, far beyond the mountains, Come never here again, leave your barrow empty. Lost and forgotten be, darker than the darkness, where gates stand forever shut, till the world is mended. At these words there was a cry, and part of the inner end of the chamber fell with a crash. Then there was a long trailing shriek, fading away into an unguessable distance, and after that, Silence. Come, friend Frodo, said Tom. Let us get out on clean grass. You must help me bear them. Together they carried out Mary Pippin and Sam. As Frodo left the barrow for the last time, he thought he saw a severed hand wriggling still, like a wounded spider in a heap of fallen earth. Tom went back in again, and there was a sound of much thumping and stamping. When he came out, he was bearing in his arms a great load of treasure. Things of gold, silver, copper, and bronze, many beads and chains, and jeweled ornaments. He climbed the green barrow and laid them all on top in the sunshine. There he stood, with his hat in his hand and the wind in his hair, and looked down upon the three hobbits that had been laid on their backs upon the grass at the west side of the mound. Raising his right hand, he said in a clear, commanding voice, Wake now, my merry lads! Wake and hear me calling! Warm now, be heart and limb, the cold stone is fallen. 
dark door is standing wide, dead hand is broken, night under night has flown, and the gates are open! To Frodo's great joy, the hobbits stirred, stretched their arms, rubbed their eyes, and then suddenly sprang up. They looked about in amazement, first at Frodo, and then at Tom, standing larger as life on the barrow top above them, and then at themselves in their thin white rags, crowned and belted with pale gold and jingling with trinkets. Uh, what in the name of wonder? began Merry, feeling the golden circlet that slipped over one eye. Then he stopped and a shadow came over his face, and he closed his eyes. Of course, I remember, he said. The men of Karn Dune came on us at night, and we were worsted. <sighs> a spear in my heart. He clutched at his breast. No, he said, opening his eyes. What am I saying? I've been dreaming. Where did you get to, Frodo? I thought I was lost, said Frodo, but I don't want to speak of it. Let us think of what we are to do now. Let us go on. Dressed up it like this, sir, said Sam. Where are my clothes? He flung his circlet, belt, and rings on the grass, and looked around helplessly as if he expected to find his cloak, jacket, and breeches and other hobbit garments lying somewhere to hand. You won't find your clothes again, said Tom, bounding down from the mound and laughing as he danced around in the sunlight. One would have thought that nothing dangerous or dreadful had happened, and indeed, the horror faded out of their hearts as they looked at him, and saw the merry glint in his eyes. What, what, what do you mean? asked Pippin, looking at him, half puzzled and half amused. Why not? But Tom shook his head, saying, You found yourselves again, out of the deep water. Clothes are but little loss if you escape from drowning. Be glad, my merry friends, and let the warm sunlight heat now heart and limb. Cast off these cold rags. Run naked on the grass while Tom goes a hunting. He sprang away downhill, whistling and calling. Looking down after him, Frodo saw him running away southwards along the green hollow between the hill and the next, still whistling and crying. Hey now, come boy now, with a doo wonder. Up down near of our here, do the younger, sour waves wise to swish tail and bumpkin. Like such, my little lad, and old fatty so he sang, running fast, tossing up his hat and catching it until it was hidden by a fold of the ground. But for some time his hey now, hoy now, came floating back down the wind, which had shifted round towards the south. The air was growing very warm again. The hobbits ran about for a while on the grass as he told them, and they lay basking in the sun with the delight of those that had been wafted suddenly from bitter winter to a friendly clime. Or of people that, after being long ill and bedridden, wake one day to find that they are unexpectedly well, and the day is again full of promise. By the time that Tom returned, they were feeling strong and hungry. He reappeared, hat first, over the brow of the hill, and behind him came in an obedient line six ponies, their own five, and one more. The last was plainly old Fatty Lumpkin. He was larger, stronger, fatter, and older than their own ponies. Mary, to whom the others belonged, had not, in fact, given them any such names, but they answered to their new names that Tom had given them for the rest of their lives. Tom called them one by one, and they climbed over the brow and stood in the line. Then Tom bowed to the hobbits. Here are your ponies now, he said. They've more sense, in some ways, than you wandering hobbits have. More sense in their noses. For they sniff danger ahead, which you walk right into. And if they run to save themselves, then they run the right way. You must forgive them all, for though their hearts are faithful, to face fear of Barrow Whites is not what they were made for. <laughs> See, here they come again, bringing all their burdens. Merry Sam and Pippin now clothed themselves in spare garments from their packs, and they soon felt too hot for they were obliged to put on some of the thicker and warmer things that they had brought against the oncoming of winter. Where does that other old animal, that fatty lumpkin, come from? asked Frodo. Ah, oh, he's mine, said Tom, my four-legged friend. Though I seldom ride him, and he wanders often far, free upon the hillsides. When your pony stayed with me, they got to know my lumpkin, and they smelt him in the night, and quickly ran to meet him. I thought he'd look for them, and with his words of wisdom, 
take all their fear away. But now, my jolly lumpkin, old Tom's going to ride. Hey! He's coming with you, just to set you on the road, so he needs a pony. For you cannot easily talk to hobbits that are riding when they're on your own legs trying to trot beside them. The hobbits were delighted to hear this and thanked Tom many times. But he laughed and said that they were so good at losing themselves that he would not feel happy till he had seen them safe over the borders of his land. I've got things to do, he said. My making and my singing, my talking, my walking, and my watching of the country. Tom can't be always near to open doors and willow cracks. Tom has his house to mind, and gold berries waiting. It was still fairly early by the sun, something between nine and ten, and the hobbits turned their minds to food. Their last meal had been lunch beside the standing stone the day before. They breakfasted now off the remainder of Tom's provisions, meant for their supper, with additions that Tom had brought with him. It was not a large meal, considering hobbits and their circumstances, but they felt much better for it. While they were eating, Tom went up the mound and looked through the treasures. Most of these he made into a pile that glistened and sparkled on the grass. He bade them lie there, free to all finders, birds, beasts, elves, men, and all kindly creatures. For so the spell of the mound should be broken and scattered, and no white ever come back to it. He chose for himself from the pile a brooch set with blue stones, many shaded like flax flowers or the wings of blue butterflies. He looked long at it, as if stirred by some memory, shaking his head and saying at last, Here is a pretty toy for Tom and for his lady. Fair was she who long ago wore this on her shoulder. Goldberry shall wear it now, and we will not forget her. For each of the hobbits he chose a dagger, long, leaf-shaped, and keen, of marvellous workmanship, damasked with serpent forms in red and gold. They gleamed as he drew them from their black sheaths, wrought of some strange metal, light and strong, and set with many fiery stones. Whether by some virtue in these sheaths, or because of the spell that lay on the mound, the blade seemed untouched by time, unrusted, sharp, uh, glittering in the sun. All knives are long enough as swords for hobbit people, he said. Sharp blades are good to have if shire folk go walking, east, south, or far away into dark and danger. Then he told them that these blades were forged many long years ago by men of Westerness. They were foes of the Dark Lord, but they were overcome by the evil king of Karandun in the land of Angmar. Hmm, few now remember them. Tom murmured, yet still some go wandering, sons of forgotten kings, walking in loneliness, guarding from evil things, folk that are heedless. The oh, hobbits did not understand his words, but as he spoke, they had a vision, as it were, of a great expanse of years behind them, like a vast shadowy plain over which there strode shapes of men, tall and grim, with bright swords, and last came one with a star on his brow. Then the vision faded, and they were back in the sunlit world. It was time to start again. They made ready, packing their bags and adding their ponies. Their new weapons they hung on their leather belts under their jackets, feeling them very awkward and wondering if they would be of any use. Uh, Fighting had like not before occurred to any of them here. as one of the adventures in which their flight would land them. Uh, At last they set off. And then, mounting, they trotted quickly along the valley. They looked back and saw the top of the old mound on the hill, and from it the sunlight on the gold went up like a yellow flame. Then they turned a shoulder of the downs, and it was hidden from view. Though Frodo looked about him on every side, he saw no sign of the great stone standing like a gate, and before long they came to the northern gap and rode swiftly through, and the land fell away before them. It was a merry journey with Tom Bombadil trotting gaily beside them, or before them, on Fatty Lumpkin, who could move much faster than his girth promised. Tom sang most of the time, but it was chiefly nonsense, or else perhaps a strange language unknown to the hobbits. An ancient language whose words were mainly those of wonder and delight. They went forward steadily, but they soon saw that the road was further away than they had imagined. Even without a fog, their sleep at midday would have prevented them from reaching it until an after nightfall on the day before. 
The dark line they had seen was not a line of trees, but a line of bushes, growing on the edge of a deep dike within a steep wall on the further side. Tom said that it had once been the boundary of a kingdom, but a very long time ago. He seemed to remember something sad about it, and would not say much. They climbed down and out of the dike, and through a gap in the wall. Well, and then do, Tom turned due north, for they had been uh, buried. Don't know. So that's all I have for this time. So hit like and subscribe. See you next time. Bye bye.